order your book and you will get a signed copy delivered to your home or wherever you tell us you live um, in the next few days. A signed first edition copy of this book and so many others. That's what Author's Voice is about. It's one of the things you can do with Author's Voice. Develop a fine library, a fine personal collection of signed first edition books. All of your favorite books signed by the authors and in first edition. Who are we talking to today? Well, that's the good news. That's uh, some of the exciting news today. Today we are going to discuss the heroines of Mercy Street, the real nurses of the Civil War by Pamela D. Toller, PhD. And this is the book, and it is also the book that is the companion volume to the PBS program Mercy Street. I'm sure you've probably seen it the last two seasons, uh, that, uh, that fine PBS program about Civil War nurses in Alexandria, Virginia. This is the real story of Mercy Street. And uh, so welcome to the show, Pamela D. Toller. Great to be here. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to take a minute and tell our uh, audience about you and about your uh, resume. Uh, Pamela D. Toller, is, she's the author of the Everything Guide to Socialism, the author of Mankind, the story of all of us, and then most recently this book, Heroines of Mercy Street, the real nurses of the Civil War. Uh, Toller grew up in Springfield, Missouri, where she participated in living history programs at Wilson's Creek National Battlefield. There she learned to load and shoot muzzle-loading rifles. Uh, that's a good one for the resume. Keep Absolutely. That on the resume there. And, uh, and, uh, and while doing though, so she read and reread the biographies of great women such as Clara Barton, Julia Ward Howe, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Her life as a history buff then took an abrupt turn when she fell in love with Rudyard Kipling's Kim. And that was the first step to this PhD from the University of Chicago in South Asia right. history. Um, and then, uh, but the lifelong fascination with the Civil War continues, and thus we have this book. Yes. Pamela, tell us about how you came to write the true story of the Nurses of Mercy Street. You know, the short answer is yeah. they asked me, <laughs> <laughs> which is always nice. Good answer. Um, PBS was working on Mercy Street. They'd reached the point where they decided they wanted a companion book. I had written previously the companion book to the History Channel program, which was Mankind, the Story of All of Us. And so someone who had worked with me suggested me for the program, for, for the book. But, you know, I probably wouldn't have taken the job because it was an insane time period. I mean, the, the deadlines were just ridiculous. But it hooked to just my, my oldest history love, which was the Civil War, and particularly women in the Civil War. So it was really going back to my roots. Did you already know some book. of these women before you picked up this project? You know, it's interesting because I went into it thinking I knew something mm -hmm. about the nurses. I thought I knew what they looked like. I knew Clara Barton, of course. I knew um, Louisa May Alcott. Mm -hmm. And I went in expecting all the nurses to pretty much look like that, to be the, the Dorothea Dix brand. And to my surprise, they didn't all look like that. It was a much more complicated demographic. Um, they really came from all classes of society. There were escaped slaves and free African Americans. There were New York socialites and there were farm wives. There were teenage girls. There were these middle-aged women who were exactly who I expected to be nurses. There were grandmothers. Um, so it was a much broader range of people. Um, and that, that was fascinating. It meant the story was much richer. Mm -hmm. One of the things I th that you point out early in the book is that uh, I, I think, or at least I, have reached a, uh, 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 a wrong conclusion about one of the things that Dorothea Dix, Dix was famously asking for. Uh, and I've heard on a number of places, Ken Burns' documentary led me to believe this, that she was asking for women who were not attractive. She doesn't, that isn't really what she's asking in that job description, is she? No, though, I mean, what she asks for, if you read the literal words, is mm. she wants them to be 
not fancy. No. As a, I mean, the yeah. word is plain, plain but, uh, but she's meaning not fancy. Now, admittedly, if someone was too pretty, she also saw that as fancy, and she would object. Mm -hmm. but, but the real line was not fancy. You know, mm -hmm. hair not curled, no bows on clothes, no lace on clothes, stripped down to the plainest of clothing, wearing dark clothing, which is very practical if you're working in a blood-soaked hospital, um, with very little opportunity to clean those dresses. Yeah. Um, so yeah, she's, she does ask for plain, but she doesn't necessarily mean homely. I think with a lot, like a lot of good job descriptions, she's telling the potential candidates exactly what to expect of their right. job. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, we did start with you mentioning that this is the companion to Mercy Street. How often does your book intersect with that um, TV show? It does in that several of the characters in the television show are actually based on real-life women who I deal with in the book. And in fact, the narrative arc of my book is based on the life of one particular nurse who is Mary Finney von Olnhausen who is the base for Mary Finney, who's the major character in the show. Um, the two are considerably different. The historical Mary Finney is um, older, more um, authoritative <laughs> in style, um, but they really do deal with her life in, in some fundamentally correct ways. And they, they also clearly draw aspects of Louisa May Alcott and add to that character. The other place that it links is in um, the character of Nurse Hastings, who is based on a very loosely and unkindly mm -hmm. based on a real life woman called Anne Reading, who was in fact a nurse in the Crimea with Florence Nightingale, and who then served as a nurse in the Civil War. Um, and while she definitely, in her own memoir, admits to liking an occasional drink, and she does have a certain sense of superiority about British medical tactic, techniques as, compo as compared to American. She really isn't quite as delightfully awful as Nurse Hastings is. <laughs> we'll call that one of those composite characters. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> they, they used her as a springboard. It's true. It's just true about 10 different people. Right, <laughs> right. We have a question from, uh, that came in. So thank you very much to Vern in Paoli, Pennsylvania. Um, does Mary Walker make an appearance in this book? Mary Walker began as a nurse but ended up as a doctor uh, and then won the Medal of Honor, which was then revoked mm -hmm. and then under President Carter re-established. Re a very fascinating woman. But does Mary Walker get into this um, book? She does not. Mm -hmm. um, actually, the way I organized the book, most of the nurses who are in the book come through Mercy, through Mansion House Hospital in some way or are roughly attached to it. Walker, though fascinating, in some ways she was, she was almost functioning more as a doctor than a nurse to begin with. And she really didn't fit any of the places that I went in the book. And that was a problem with the book is there are so many women who are just their own thing mm -hmm. that they don't really make it. Mother Bickerdike is another yeah. who, mm -hmm. fascinating, probably deserves her own book, though I don't think there is a one, or at least not a very current one, out there, mm -hmm. but does not really help you understand the broader story of nurses. No, Mother B Bickerdike could use a fantastic biography. She In could. In case you're thinking of another project, <laughs> Mary Ann Bickerdike is one of my favorite from Galesburg, Illinois. Yep. Uh, for those people that love Lincoln <laughs> or Carl Sandburg. She's amazing. She's an amazing woman. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you had mentioned that okay, the Mercy Street and your book do focus on one particular Civil War hospital. It's Mansion House Hospital in Alexandria, right. Virginia. Did, do you think that that was a typical Army hospital? Um, it was typical of the hospitals early in the war, which were almost all improvised from a building that was designed for something else. It was actually one of the larger hospitals in Alexandria. By the end of the war, there were 33, I believe, 31 or 33 hospitals in Alexandria, some of which were specially built. 
but early in the war, almost all the hospitals were made from buildings that the government requisitioned and repurposed. Um, so to that extent, they were, it was very typical, mm -hmm. which meant it was badly designed for the purpose, it didn't have proper sanitation for the purpose, um, rooms were small, hallways were narrow. In the case of Mansion House, I mean, Mary Finney von Olmhausen complains that she, there's, she has no way to heat water in her ward. So she goes up four flights of stairs 10, 12, 15 times a day just to take care of basic things. Later in the war, as they began to build hospitals that took into account modern, modern ideas mm -hmm. about medical care, the hospitals looked very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so Mansion House is, a, is typical of a hospital at one time mm -hmm. during the war. Now, Alexandria also has a unique characteristic in, in yeah. this. Uh, and I, but we, we, uh, Matt was showing us the, the Sneedon uh, mm -hmm. uh, oh, illustration of Alex. Yeah. It's wonderful, wonderful watercolor. What unique characteristics of Alexandria, Virginia come into the book as opposed to other places? Um, part of it is just it is the city, the southern city that is occupied for the longest time over the course of the war. So it's very much an occupied city. It is the center of the quartermasters for the, for the East Coast, for the Union. And it's the doorway to DC. So that there's always this sense that it's a city that could be in danger, it's a city that could be taken. It's not exactly on the front, but it feels like it's on the front. And because it's so close to many of the battles in Virginia, it gets an enormous number of patients. Alexandria is the city where patients are brought first. So they get men in their worst condition. And as they get well, they get shipped further north. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that the, that these characters, uh, uh, Finney and Reading, uh, they are women that are on the, n nurses that are on the front, as close to the front line uh, as mm -hmm. any of these Dix nurses are. Right, mm -hmm. right. In some ways, the nurses who end up being closest to the front line are the ones who are on the hospital transport ships mm -hmm. that the um, Sanitary Commission runs during the Peninsular Campaign. And it was fascinating because those got billed as being safe so that mm -hmm. women whose families didn't really want them to go nurse in a hospital mm -hmm. felt that this would be a safe way, but it meant they were right there because right. they're mm -hmm. at the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why those ships didn't last very long. When it got to the point where the Confederates were shooting at the ships, they decided to get the women off Right, them. that transport project was really just 1862, was it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Or so, during the time of the Peninsula mm -hmm, Right, campaign. so that, they end up being the women who are closest to the front, other than, of course, the unofficial women who just go to the battlefields. Mm -hmm. Now, nursing is already a hard job, uh, but one through line of this book is that it was a lot harder for a lot of reasons during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what were a few of the challenges that female nurses faced beyond caring for sick and wounded? The first was that most of the doctors didn't want them there. <laughs> I mean, realistically, before no, the Civil War, nursing wasn't a job for a respectable woman. And when Dix proposes this nursing corps, it's a, it's a revolutionary proposal. Before that, the Army had used convalescent soldiers who would be used on an ad hoc basis as nurses. And they didn't really see any reason to change that. So doctors thought nurses didn't have the upper body strength to do the job. They said they didn't have the training to do the job, which was kind of funny because convalescent soldiers had no training. Um, they felt it was um, no job for a lady. One surgeon told a nurse that nurses cease, ladies cease to be ladies when they become a nurse. <laughs> so one of the things they really deal with is just hostility from the doctors they're working with. And over time that changes, but it changes one nurse, one doctor at a time all Hostility the way through the war. Breaking this Victorian mold right. of what a right. lady of what a lady is like. supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now speaking of what a lady is supposed to look like, here's one of my favorite Civil War ladies. 
We are Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, and that means that we can feature artifacts of the Civil War and some of the people in the Civil War. And here is one of our favorites, Clara Barton. She's not one of the Dix nurses. Right. Uh, but here she is signing a card at the height of her fame, 1902. It says there's St. Petersburg, Florida, 1902. And she signs this, this card for somebody, and she's wearing her red cross, and she's mm -hmm. looking like who you think Clara Barton is. I, tell us how Clara Barton fits into your story. In some ways, she's an anti-Dix nurse because she has no official affiliation with anyone. At the time the war broke out, she was one of four women who worked for the federal government. She was a clerk in the patent office. And the fourth floor, the attic of the patent office, got turned into a... Um, improvised hospital after the first Battle of Bull Run. So whenever she had a break, she would go upstairs and help. And as time went on, she just reached the sense that she needed to do more. And she began to collect supplies. She would write to a, a network of women that she set up to make bandages, to provide foodstuffs. And then she talked the army into giving her a wagon and a horse and a pass that let her travel. And she began to just travel the battlefields. And she would set up and she would make soup and she would feed men and she would clean wounds. And in between battles, she'd go back to Washington and would write letters begging for more supplies and write newspaper articles saying how bad the situation was. And then she'd go back out. Um, after the war, then, she did some pretty amazing things, too. She basically became a one-woman office for finding missing soldiers. And then when she just totally wore herself out, she went for what was supposed to be a rest to Europe and began working for the Red Cross in the War of 18, the 1870 Franco-Prussian War. Um, and from there, began to lobby for the American adoption of the Red Cross. So she really founds the American Red Cross mm -hmm. then. But what she does is, she does it on her own. Yeah. And is almost, uh, by being an insurgent in that way, right. she's, she's almost, uh, uh, almost as effective as the system that was created by Dorothea Dix. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and she's a one person mm -hmm. operation, but enormously successful. And she, was, she made such an impact that there were dozens of little girls after the war who were named Clara Barton by fathers who, whom she had helped. Amazing, amazing. And, but do you think both with her, we've talked about Dorothea Dix and what mm -hmm. she wanted from that job description. Right. We talked about uh, Clara Barton and how she manages to have some success. To what extent does class have anything to do with this? Do these, most of these women seem middle class, but there's some... There, interesting exceptions. There are some really interesting exceptions. And I mean, the most visible ones for us are middle class. One of my favorites is Amy Morris Bradley, who was a carpenter's daughter, I'm sorry, a cobbler's daughter from Maine. Definitely not middle class. Um, she reinvented herself time and again. She became a school teacher, and then she went to Puerto Rico and teaches herself Spanish and founds an English language school and then comes back. I mean, she's, she is not from this middle class educated same field as Dix or as Finney or Clara Barton. She's just a hard scrabble woman. And she's the one who um, gets assigned to transforming Fort Misery. The, that convalescent, the convalescent camp, camp. You write about. Now that's yeah. fascinating. Because yeah. here's a camp of healthy healthy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Man. But Amy ends up, ends up working in that. She ends up and working in that and they send men there with no plans for how you get them out of there. And it's also badly located so that sewage and water just drains into it. So it's essentially a swamp. So men who are relatively healthy when they're sent there get sick and get stuck there. Um, she goes, first she lobbies to get it moved so that it's not drained. And then once they've moved it to higher ground so that men aren't 
in immediate danger, then she goes and she puts systems in place that didn't exist to get clothing distributed, to get food distributed, to get medical care, um, to get a tub. They have an entire camp of men and no way to wash them. So she has one tub and it's an amazing innovation. Um, she does, performs like a USO and brings Chinese checkers and cards so that men who don't have any energy have some, a way to amuse themselves. And she also helps men get out. She helps them get their discharge papers. She gets them back to DC. She walks them through the system to collect back pay to get them on a train to go home. If they're bedridden, they can't go stand in line at the, right. at the paymaster's office. They can't even go stand in line to get their discharge papers. Mm -hmm. So there are men who have been discharged and can't get home. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's another fascinating story. And it's a fascinating story about how she creates this system. And then uh, while Barton seems to operate outside the system, there is this other system that we haven't talked about that's very important in your book, and that's the Sanitary Commission. Right. And uh, do they have a, do they come into Mansion House, or do they come into? Um, they do not really come into Mansion House, but because the nursing situation is so fluid and has so many parts, people move sometimes from the Sanitary Commission to Mansion House or back. Um, Bradley ends up there a couple of times just on a visit and says, you know, I just really can't do this. There are too many stairs and there's too much authority. So she doesn't want to be part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and Anne Reading does, in fact, serve on the hospital transport ships and then ends up at Mansion right, House so she after moves that. back and forth. Right. Does, do, did Dix and, did Dorothea Dix and the Sanitary Commission butt heads? Yeah, Dick's yeah. butted heads with everybody. <laughs> but they what started. She was, what she was about, wasn't it? That's right. Um, but they started out working together, and early on they would send her nurses. And then as the Sanitary Commission became less involved with nurses and more involved with organizing hospitals, they moved further and further apart. Okay. And then one person I don't want to miss out on is uh, Miss Louise May. Miss Little Women. Uh, she does, of course, have a biography. And there she was, the author of Little Women, one of mm -hmm. our most wonderful parlor. Right. Uh, I, I don't want to call it a romance, but a, a wonderful lit work of literature. A wonderful work of literature. literature of that time and that place, Joe March and her sisters. Mm -hmm. Yet there was Louisa May Alcott in the unit. Horrible Union House Hospital. In Union Hotel Hospital, which was oh. absolutely awful. She called it a pestilential box. Um, and she actually, she only lasted for 40 days because she got typhoid pneumonia while she was there. Um, she became so ill, her father had to come get her, and she never really recovered. Um, her supervisor caught the same disease, nursing the same men, and died. So she actually was lucky. But, and one of the first things she wrote that made her nationally well known was, in fact, Hospital Sketches, which was a fictional, a thinly fictionalized account of her experience there. And it's one of the first of the memoirs that's published, because it's published while this war is still going on. It's published during the war. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the war ended, but these nurses don't, some of them do stop nursing. Most of, Some them of them stop go on, and and one of the Anne Reading, one of your mm -hmm. really most uh, dynamic nurses, settles down. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do. I don't want to end our story without finding out how our Mary Finney, who's pictured here on our dust jacket, mm -hmm. how does our Mary Finney end up winning the Iron Cross from the Kaiser? Mary Finney. When the Franco-Prussian War broke out, she really felt she had to go. She had been on a homestead in Illinois, working hard, but her husband had been the Baron von Olmhausen. And she really, she wanted to nurse again. My guess is she wanted to get off the prairie, and she also felt a real need to help her husband's people. So with no German, teaching herself German on the ship over. She goes, she basically talks her way into a nursing situation. 
then the war ended. And they were trying to get people out. And there was this group of very ill men who were in France, who were German, who they just couldn't travel. And so she agreed to stay with them. And then it became dangerous, and she needed to get them out. It was the uprising. Because people were beginning to, the, the French were just kind of unhappy with the terms were, of the peace agreement. The of and, they, they, and there were, in, any Prussian soldiers who were left behind were kind of a fair target. So she goes through this two-week ordeal of just one thing going wrong after another to get the men out. And then retro, after that, is given given the Iron She's Cross. Given that Iron Cross yep. for, for valor in, yep. uh, by, the, by the Prussians. Right. Well, this brings us back to the story, to the, mm -hmm. to the show, Mercy right. Street. And one of the really interesting things, I think, about that show is it's, uh, uh, it's pretty dynamic across media. Yeah. Of course, you can watch it. Mm -hmm. You can watch the story of uh, uh, of the doctors and the nurses and the contrabands and the soldiers at Mercy mm -hmm. Street, but you can also go to the PBS website and they have uh, a lot of they have a, a very rich blog mm -hmm. uh, with uh, uh, wonderful experts like Shauna Devine who was on our show right. with her book about how the Civil War uh, influenced medical research mm -hmm. and she has, and then they also have a lot of social media. Mm -hmm. and, how do you think it, both with your book and with the show, how do you think this sort of multi-platform approach works? I think it works really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, they did a great job of people being interested in the show ahead of time because they did so much outreach with this multimedia program and discussions with major experts. I mean, you. Three months before the show started, you could go, and there were interviews, live interviews with experts talking in wonderful ways about the show, but also about the context for the show. Um, social media, uh, they were very active with it. They're still really active with it, so that they were touching base during the shows itself. I mean, one thing that I found fun and unexpected was live tweeting during the show because the producers were on, PBS was on, experts were on, the Clara Barton Museum was on, the Civil War Medical Museum was on. You had ongoing interaction about the show, about the issues of the show, about the history behind the show. And they never lost track of its roots in history. Mm -hmm. Never. It's a Which good show. Two wonderful. seasons. Two, two seasons. seasons of the doctors and the nurses mm -hmm. and, and everybody else at the Mansion House Hospital in Alexandria. Now, Alexandria is fine, but we're in Chicago. Right. So there's one more thing I want to, one more Easter egg I want to bring onto our show, and that's our own, our own favorite nurse from Chicago, and that's the great Mary Livermore. Um, and uh, Mary Livermore, of course, she, she was uh, here in Chicago uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, f founded the Northwestern Sanitary Fair. And during the course of that, came up with uh, a way of getting all of the local, uh, all of the local people that were supporting, all the businesses that were supporting the sanitary fair together in one building, selling all of their things, a mall. Right. Mary invented the mall. Uh, but Mary, she, does, she gets into your book at the very end, and I think it's one of the most interesting takes. After the war, all of the veterans founded veterans organizations. And they got together, and they met, and they had dinner, and they drank, and they told each other how great they did. Mm -hmm. By about 1901 or so, nursing is now a profession. And right. professional nurses are meeting, and Mary Livermore gets up and gives a very interesting presentation. It was fascinating, because it was the sixth annual meeting of the American Nurses Association. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that a group of Civil War nurses were meeting in the same building. And so there was a little back and forth about that. And it turned out that after they had had this discussion as an organization, the next speaker was, in fact, Mary Livermore. 
And I've always thought that was a setup because it was just a little too pat to not be. But she stands up and she says, you know, a, a meeting of trained nurses, you know, I never thought such a thing would happen. I always thought it would be wonderful. And then she says, but remember, those women did amazing things without any of the advantages that you would have had if you were there. And now you're their legacy. You know, there are nurses who are trained, who know what to do and know how to do it, and know when to obey. And this, I always thought, this is the important part, and know when not to obey. And you'll be there for another war. You can, if there's another war, you can be called up. She said, it's the best thing that's happened for the status of women in the last 50 years. And it's a direct result of those women who volunteered to nurse in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And so it was a bit of a, it was a veterans reunion. It was, right? it was a veterans, <laughs> it was a veterans reunion. Veterans reunion, veterans of the Civil War. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you for joining us.